Uh, thanks very much indeed, and it's very nice to be back to the West of Scotland Pain Group to chat. I must confess a degree of um, guilt uh, this evening for, for my poor attendance at the West of Scotland Pain Group over the last uh, couple of years, so I can only hope to uh, atone for my sins in some way this evening. Um, it's very nice to uh, come and chat, and... Um, for the more observant of you, you, you might have noticed I've, I've subtly changed the title um, of my talk uh, to A Beginner's Guide to This Beginner's Guide um, through absolutely no sense of false modesty on my part whatsoever, I have to say. And despite the fact that um, I, I, I've been lucky enough to uh, have been exposed to quite a bit of training uh, to do with this therapeutic approach and I use it quite sort of regularly with the patients that I see, there's still large parts of it that make me feel very much like a, a, a beginner. Uh, this is such a, um, on the face of it, paradoxical approach uh, and so uh, different in many respects to the sort of standard approaches that we've been used to in working with patients with chronic pain, uh, such as CBT and, and behavioural approaches, um, uh, that there are, there are often days when I'm sitting hearing myself uh, uh, describe these concepts with patients and thinking that uh, they, mu they must think that I'm off my head, frankly. Um, but what I would hope to do tonight is uh, to keep things simple, um, partly because I do still feel myself to be a bit of a, a, of a, of a, of a beginner. And um, there's a bit of a paradox as well, I guess, um, in talking to you about this approach, uh, or a couple of paradoxes, I, su I suppose. One is that, that the more I, I, I or, or anybody else talk about a subject like this, the more I run the risk of overcomplicating things and it going from a beginner's guide to a sort of a more complex, overly embellished thing. And those who know me I, I know that I'm, I'm prone to doing that from time to time. And the other paradox, of course, is that um, Acceptance and commitment therapy is kind of known as um, a, an experiential type of approach, which means that there's a lot of it that you kind of only get um, when you're actually doing it. And there's a lot of it that, that the more you try to explain, the more it doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, So I'm going to try for once in my life to not spend too much time uh, talking this evening. I always promise that and uh, usually utterly fail in the attempt. But I have said to Andy that I would expect to speak for about 40 minutes. That's a number I've just pulled out of thin air. Um, but I will try as much as I possibly can to stick to that. So I'm going to keep it simple, hopefully interesting, and um, hopefully we'll have a good bit of time at the end to perhaps um, I, um, attempt to answer all of your um, your, your questions or any questions that you have. Okay, so what we're we going to do? Very simply, we're going to have a little think about what we mean by ACT and what it actually um, is, is trying to do. To talk a little bit more about those paradoxes of, of acceptance and commitment therapy as well and look at how it, um, it differs to the more sort of traditional therapies, the sort of CBTs and various things like that, that that, um, that we still use. Have a little bit of a think about how some of the concepts might be helpful in uh, chronic pain management, which is obviously the main focus of the talk. Uh, and so do those first three things as quickly as we possibly can, and then give you a whistle-stop tour around something that's known as the, the hexaflex. And, um, There'll probably be more psycho jargon and psycho babble uh, in the course of the talk, but um, that hexaflex will become a little bit, hopefully, a little bit clearer when I put up a diagram in a little while. Basically, there are sort of six core concepts to act, and I just want to take you through them in a very light way, uh, using a variety of um, uh, descriptors and uh, and metaphors. And as you see, if, if you're a fan of metaphors, this is the therapy for you. All right. So that's what we're going to try and do as quick as we possibly can um, and see where we get with it. 
Um, I'm presuming that most of you will um, be familiar with the concept of mindfulness. Uh, that's, you know, that's the sort of buzzword, the buzz uh, technique, I guess, around pain management, the length and breadth of, well, globally, really, at the moment. Um, but the sense I get, perhaps, is that um, ACT is a little bit of the, the, you know, the poor relation a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's a shame because one of the things we hope to sort of explain tonight as well is uh, that ACT is a good way of trying to make a bit better sense of, of mindfulness and what it's trying to do as well. And sometimes we, when we look at mindfulness on its own, we can sometimes take it out of context in terms of the wider sense of trying to get patients to move towards a bit more of an acceptance and a, and a willingness stance, I guess, with the, uh, with the pain. And I think uh, considering mindfulness within an ACT framework kind of expands our horizon a little bit and gives us some other ways in, in which we can think about mindfulness and how it might work for our patients, okay? So that's the grand plan. So there's no internet connection. I was going to show you a nice little video from somebody called Russ Harris, but sadly, no, fine. So that's usually the first thing when anybody mentions the idea of acceptance um, of any sort of type, of any sort of uh, difficulty like pain or anything else, depression, anxiety. What do you mean I should just go away and accept it? Don't you know I've been spending the last 20 or 30 years trying desperately to get rid of it? and now you're suggesting the opposite. So ACT doesn't do itself any favors, let's face it, in terms of just, just what it calls itself, acceptance and commitment therapy. And it seems to be so counterintuitive that we run the risk almost immediately before we start of, of getting people, particularly our patients, to think, well, you know, what on earth are you on here? You know, this is absolutely crazy. And of course, acceptance is such a, a loaded word. And, and for those of us working in pain management, um, it, it tends to be sort of synonymous with a sense of uh, giving up, passive resignation, um, uh, letting, letting oneself be sort of drowned in it, you know? And I think that, that always there's the risk of that simply because of the way in which we sort of um, uh, tend to define accept, acceptance uh, in our own minds. But hey ho, if we go to the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, look and def uh, for, for a definition of acceptance, we actually find something quite different. Um, and we see a definition that, that, that is much more um, around some of the stuff that we're actually trying to do in ACT. So the action of consenting to receive or undertake something offered, or a willingness to tolerate a, def uh, a, a, dif a, a difficult situation. So that's quite amazing, isn't it? You know, most of us have that sort of idea of acceptance of just sort of, you know, well, just putting up with things, you know, just getting on with things. Um, but actually, the definition, when we look at, at, at the definition of, of acceptance, it's far more dynamic and it's far more about um, taking on something in a, in, in a much more positive manner very often than the, uh, you know, than the, the, the sort of mindset that we often have when we think about acceptance. So that's something to bear in mind is my thought. So it's much more of a positive thing. So acceptance of commitment therapy, what are we talking about? Um, uh, many of you will know of the work of Lance McCracken and his colleagues um, uh, who had been down at the Bath um, uh, Pain Management Programme but is now at um, uh, King's College, I believe, uh, in, in London. And he did a lot of work around sort of uh, questionnaires, and you, I'm sure you, many of you be familiar with things like the chronic pain acceptance questionnaire and things like that that, that he developed. And he looked through a variety of sort of techniques, factor analysis and various things like that, uh, to, to sort of um, drill down into actually what we're, what we're meaning in the context of acceptance and commitment therapy. Acceptance being seen as a willingness to have or be with, not just... Um, positive experiences but also negative ones as well and alongside just simply acceptance a willingness to commit um, uh, and be focused towards um, um, val what we call valued living okay so there's, there's two things there a willingness to have or a willingness to be exposed to uh, both positive and negative experiences in life but also a, a, a willingness and a commitment to move forward 
uh, towards something because I guess we can, we can accept or we can encourage our patients to accept the possibility of ongoing pain, but that in itself is not going to be particularly helpful. Um, we need something else alongside that. And what acceptance and commitment therapy is trying to do is to help patients move in a direction that's going to lead to a little bit more of, uh, in the way of meaningful uh, living, I guess. So it's those two concepts I'm just encouraging you to, to keep in mind as we, as we look a little bit more uh, uh, in depth at this. Okay, so acceptance and commitment. What are the aims? What on earth are we trying to do with this therapeutic approach? And it is a therapy, I suppose, uh, I guess. So what are, we, what are we aiming to do? I think probably... Um, there's a number of aims. I think probably one of the, the, the biggest things that we're trying to look at is helping people, um, and it's not just pain patients, this is something that, that, you know, that applies to our everyday living as well. It's, uh, as we're going to say, it's not a, um, a, a therapy looking to sort or fix pathology, psychopathology. Um, it's as applicable to our everyday lives as it is to, to, you know, to, to difficulties. So. I think one of the, the big things about ACT is it's a, an attempt to try and broaden out one's awareness of what's going on, particularly of some of the struggles uh, that we have in, in, in life, whether that's, that's uh, dealing with uh, difficult situations in the external environment or internally in terms of difficult thoughts, difficult feelings. So instead of necessarily just going straight at those struggles and dealing with them and fixing them and sorting them, what ACT is trying to do is actually, at least in the first instance, making us much more aware of, of those struggles. Because very often we're not necessarily aware that those struggles are actually occurring until we end up feeling stressed or feeling upset uh, or feeling that we're running around uh, uh, crazy. A uh, lovely title of a book, which I still think is one of the best titles of, of any book that I've, uh, that I've seen, uh, uh, Get Out Your Mind and Into Your Life. Um, now, it's a bit of an Americanism, I know, um, but it's a very nice way of encapsulating some of the aims, which is to try to recognise when we're getting too caught up with the internal world, trying to fix our problems, trying to problem solve, trying to get solutions. And our minds are very good at getting us going and trying to do that. And heaven knows there are many you know, instances in life where that's a good thing to do. Um, but one of the problems is that we spend too much time in our heads, um, uh, then we end up not living. Learning to willingly have positive and negative experiences, as I've just said as well. Uh, so the, this, this, again, this paradoxical idea of actually embracing or at least moving towards um, as opposed to sort of resisting or pushing away some of the unpleasant things that we have in, in, in life. And heaven knows that's quite a hard sell. Um, a, a nice sort of idea that I like as well, which is another aim of ACT, is trying to prevent the downward spiral that, that many of us can feel. And certainly, you know, the patients we see with chronic pain can feel that when they get maybe a flare up, uh, the tendency is for the flare up to generate a whole load of difficult thoughts, difficult feelings. You know, I was doing really well with my pain and now it's back again and I can't do what I was going to do and then that will mean that and then that will mean that. And what can very often happen is that there's a downward spiral, not just in terms of the pain, but in terms of how people feel and what they think and then what they do. And uh, ACT, through its, its, uh, its attempts to try to help people become aware of those sorts of tussles and those sorts of difficulties um, has the potential to stop that downward spiral and to help people become more aware of some of the consequences of, of, of what's going on internally. And ultimately what, it, what ACT is aiming for, and we'll explain this in a little bit more detail, is um, uh, this, again, it's rather wishy-washy, a little bit sort of fluffy notion, a greater sense of flexibility to change your behaviours. We're all relatively you know, we're prone, all of us, to being quite inflexible. You know, we all kind of know what we like to do. We know what we're good at. We know where we're going, sort of thing. And, and, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but sometimes, and for many people, um, there's a sense that the way they think about things or they view things or because of physical symptoms or whatever, they can get stuck into a sort of a bit of a, a rigid rut um, and what ACT is trying to do is to help people see things from a different perspective 
and through that different perspective become a little bit less uh, rigid in their thinking uh, and a little bit more flexible and helping them see that they've got choices. And I'm sure you can begin to see how that can be helpful for chronic pain patients who feel, well, you know, if I just do that, then that'll happen. You know, I'll, I'll get more pain. Well, you know, what's the point? There's no point in doing that if that's happened. They have to, and you can hear the sort of thought patterns and the, the sort of um, repetitive views that, that many patients can have. And the, the most powerful thing I think that, that that can do is to give patients the sense that they do have a choice uh, that they are able to make uh, alternative choices to ones that they, that, that they have been making, uh, in the, often in the service of trying to keep their pain at bay. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, sort of end aim. And of course, our old friend, valued living as well, which we'll go into in a wee bit more detail. Um, getting people to think a little bit about how the tussles and struggles and stresses and strains that they get into and we all get into in life can lead us away from... Um, leading the sorts of lives that we actually want to, you know, very often. And of course, n no more true than with many patients with chronic pain. So those are the, those are the main sorts of themes. Um, the paradox, of course, as we, we began to sort of hint at, why would we not want to control, cure, fix unpleasant experiences, you know? Why on earth, what would, what would be the problem with doing that? Um, and of course, the problem with doing that is that we see very often that despite our best attempts to try and fix or sort or cure pain is still there or to fix or cure or sort feeling periodically low or depressed or anxious you know these things that are you know are uh, at least on a spectrum are there in our lives and not likely this is business of the pursuit of happiness you know a bit of a, a bit of a ridiculous concept when you think about the you know the truth of of of, of living so getting rid of things to get on with, with, with other things as well, you know, I mean, that, that, that's the general sort of gist that if we can get rid of, of, of the problems and we can move on to the next issue or we can, uh, we can clear a path and get on with things, then that seems to make a lot of sense. And of course, when you think about it, particularly with, with pain patients, um, uh, how, how socially reinforced are, are people's attempts to try and uh, overcome problems in their lives, you know? Um, uh, you know, to, to try and sort of um, uh, uh, fix or cure or get away, fight the good fight, push on, keep battling, all of these phrases that we hear all the time in, in, in the media um, and which are very helpful very often. But when the fight and the, the attempts to overcome the problem and to battle on are at the expense of a reasonable quality of life, might there be a problem there? So it's this sense of we shall overcome, you know, whether we should have a bit of a question mark beside that. So the paradox is that the act is trying to, to, to move away from things that seem to be, at least in the, the, the face value, fairly intuitive things to do. So it can potentially be quite a hard sell for, for the patients that we see. Um, it can be a hard sell up to the point where we can help them realise sometimes um, how effective um, or how workable their current strategies to try and push and fight or resist or avoid have actually become. Okay. So that's the paradox that, 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 that ACT is confronted with, but um, we very often find that actually with, 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 with the patients that we see that uh, in fact it's, it's um, uh, these things may well be socially reinforced, but in fact, they're not actually working for the patient. Traditional therapies. Um, the, 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 the great thing I like about ACT, despite its paradoxical nature, is that it's a very normalizing thing. As you've already begun to hear me sort of say, you know, some of, the, some of these issues that we talk about are, are relevant to, our, to ourselves. So I'm not sort of sitting down talking about clinical presentations of depression or anxiety um, or OCD or whatever um, and these therapies tend to be focused at um, uh, specific problems you know specifically sort of diagnosed problems they also seek to very often change the internal world and this is me not slagging off CBT by the way I mean you know massive evidence base it should be said but what those those types of therapies try to do is to change the internal world try to uh, alter thinking patterns, trying to get us to think differently um, based on evidence and whatever. 
uh, whereas ACT very much is uh, not in that frame. As well, uh, many traditional sort of behavioural and cognitive uh, therapies uh, focus on trying to improve activity to uh, improve mood uh, per se. So, you know, behavioural activation and all that sort of um, uh, approach. Highly effective, don't get me wrong, but the focus again with ACT uh, tends to be that activity is more uh, looked at in terms of values and in the service of just living well. <coughs> Uh, as opposed to it being a drive to improve mood, which can be a nice little sort of side effect, I suppose. And, and of course, most of the traditional therapies are all about trying to reduce the distress that people feel. And again, the paradoxical odd thing about ACT is that it doesn't necessarily do that. Certainly, it's not the main focus, um, but very often leads to a happier uh, uh, state of being uh, through uh, becoming disengaged with our thought processes and... Um, helping us focus a little bit more on what we want to do in life. And that can obviously reduce distress, although it's not the main sort of aim, given that what we're saying with ACT is that, you know, part of it is actually helping people tolerate unpleasant experiences as well. So th there we are. Th th so there's, I'm hoping you're getting a wee bit of a sense that things are a wee bit different in the ACT world as, as uh, compared to the traditional sort of CBT side of things. And already I'm sure you're beginning to see how relevant it is to chronic pain. I've already mentioned sort of, you know, particular examples. But, you know, for so many of the patients that we see, um, um, pain is seen as the enemy. It's to be avoided. It's an aversive experience. Even within the sessions, we see um, visibly how pain is an aversive experience. And of course it is. Um, but we see the attempts to sort of resist it or avoid it or get away from it, even in the way in which our patients kind of sit you know, to use a very simple, simple example. Um, and often the focus very much is for, well, you know, if you can just get my pain down to a six or a seven, then I'll be able to get on with my life, you know. Uh, as long as I can get my pain controlled, then these sorts of things that you're suggesting are a really good thing. So you've got that sort of problem where the tussle and the struggle of trying to get pain to a certain level is still um, um, uh, a focus for the patient. And control often comes via avoidance, numbing, pushing oneself, um, various types of sort of strategies to uh, help control the pain, but all of it to do with sort of uh, pushing uh, away or resisting. Um, often as well, we see patients who get caught up with trying to resolve the problem internally. Maybe if I fiddled with my medication, maybe if I got different medication, maybe if I tried to do um, a little bit less of that, a little bit more of that. And, you know, patients are, are, are dynamic individuals like we all are, you know, and they're constantly trying to seek sort of solutions to what they see as being the big major block and problem in their lives, which it often is. Um, most obviously, I think we see a huge loss of... Um, a loss of sense of self for, 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 for many patients that we see. Um, so there's this great sense of having given up a lot of things in the service of trying to keep the pain at bay. Um, but of course, what does that do? It very often doesn't keep the pain at bay, does it? Uh, and all it simply does is to take that person away from so many of the things that made them them, if you see what I mean. And all of that attempt requires energy in the service of getting the pain away. You know, if, if you think of the amount of energy, uh, whether it's mental or physical energy that patients go to, to try to, or, or use to try to minimize uh, or push away those negative experiences. Uh, and to think about, you know, um, uh, how that energy might be redirected in an ideal world. Um, and also a belief in being overwhelmed by pain if you don't continue to fight. You know, you, you hear patients, well, I don't have any option. I've just got to keep on fighting here, you know, because if I don't fight, then that pain's going to win. And if that pain's going to win, then, you know, what's the point anymore, you know? So it all makes perfect, perfect sense in, 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 in so many respects, you know? Uh, so why wouldn't patients continue to do that? But that's exactly where ACT comes in, and that's what I hope to sort of show now. Okay, so... Uh, it's fairly intuitive, I guess, that it's, it's, it's fairly relevant. Now, those of you who love metaphors will like the following. I don't know whether you can see that. Um, and ACT, I think perhaps because of its paradoxical nature, um, uses a lot of metaphor uh, and a lot of uh, sort of um, 
uh, concepts like this to get over what appear to be fairly paradoxical points, okay? So that's what I'm going to, to, to give you now. And if there was one metaphor, I guess, that uh, I found particularly helpful as a way of um, helping um, patients who come to me who particularly seem to be in that struggle, who seem to be in that fight, and very often it's those patients that we see who tend to be real pushers, you know, driven individuals who are damned if they're going to get the, you know, let the pain get the better of them under any circumstances. So they push, push, push. And um, this is actually a little metaphor that I set up uh, very often in, in therapy sessions with patients. Um, and I kind of, I, I shouldn't, it's a bit of a, self, a, bit of a confession. I cannibalize the, uh, the, the, uh, the telephone wire in the room. Right, very, very naughty of me because I don't have my own rope. Because I figured if I carry my own rope around, patients will wonder what the hell I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm about. Um, and I just string me up with that. Um, and you can see what's happening here. That um, for many patients, what it feels like is that they're kind of constantly um, uh, resisting or, or, or trying to ensure that they don't get pushed into the abyss. Um, and this is, this is a monster that's got sort of self-doubt and fear and unworthiness, but of course we can add pain to that as well. Um, and it's this sense of constantly battling and the more they seem to battle, the more the pain seems to drag them in. Does that make sense? So it's just this constant sort of push and pull with the greatest fear, of course, that um, what might happen is that they'll get pulled further towards the pain and end up going down into the abyss. And so that there's this never-ending uh, uh, energy ploughed into to, to keeping the pain at bay, I guess. You know, if you had a title for that, for that. Um, and of course, uh, eventually after a while, two hands are required. And therefore, there's no, other, there's no hands left to do anything else. And so living, I guess, with this metaphor, is, is, it becomes entirely in the service of making sure that things don't get worse you know, because, because they're bad enough at the moment, you know, why would I want them to get any worse? And of course, in, in therapy sessions, what we encourage patients to do, um, well, not say, but I'm sure you can, you can guess. <clears throat> so, what I'm going to do now then, uh, 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 as I promised, is just to take you through a very quick tour of this. Is this familiar to, be familiar to some I know, but maybe not to others? This is our hexaflex, and it's the best sort of way, and it's the central sort of way in which we can explain acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and you'll note from this diagram, even if it doesn't make sense just right at the moment, that all paths lead to that central thing of, of what I was talking about earlier, about flexibility, right? Feeling that you've got a choice, feeling that there's a way forward, feeling that there is, um, there's something that you can do. Um, and uh, what I'm going to sort of do is just to give you a little tour of, of the main sort of um, uh, ideas that make up ACT, and that includes acceptance, something called cognitive diffusion. I'm going to go up there, contact with the present moment, because that's mindfulness, and you'll be familiar with that. Selfless context, values, committed action. Okay, so make an awful lot of sense now but that's what I'm going to try and do now to make a little bit more sense of each of those uh, 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 little concepts okay and of course as with all good models there's the opposite so what we've got here is the ideal state of being you know being able to accept uh, being able to do all these other things concentrate on your values commit to doing things all that sort of stuff um, but what we too often see, and what we very often see for the patients that we see, is um, the, the opposite. So a tendency to be very avoidant, a tendency to be caught up with things, uh, a tendency to be um, uh, miles away from our particular values or our particular beliefs, and inactivity, avoidance, impulsivity, all the sorts of things that we very often see with the more distressed and more disabled chronic pain uh, patient. Okay, so that's just to give you a wee idea. And of course, leading to psychological rigidity there. So let's go back to that and then start with acceptance. I'll just take you through the wee tour. So what do we mean by acceptance? As we sort of said, 
willing engagement with unpleasant experiences. Okay, so again, very paradoxical. Blue and neck, how do you do that with patient? Um, but one way in which we do it, and I just put that at the end, is you know, for, for those of us who expose patients to difficult movements or difficult experiences, that's a very good example of, of asking patients to engage with unpleasant experiences um, as a way of realising that they're not actually you know, disastrous. Encouraging patients to do a very difficult thing, which is to abandon the fight against whatever it might be, whether it's pain, whether it's difficult feelings, whether it's anything else that comes with the pain. The idea of letting go of control as well. So that's what we're meaning by acceptance. That's what we sort of defined it as at the beginning as well. Versus, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little sort of few lines, the opposite of it, um, an example of it, and then just a little sort of metaphor as well. Um, so what we will most often see with patients is this idea of uh, more uh, experiential avoidance, resisting, struggling, battling, hoping for the next fix, being emotionally and physically invested in that, in that way of dealing with pain. And so acceptance is kind of flipping it on its, um, on its back. So the idea, of course, as we saw the thing, the whole idea there is letting go of the rope, which can be very scary for, for, for patients. But when we do that in the room and I invite them actually to take... Um, to, to let go, what I'll actually do beforehand is, do, well, what's next? You know, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen? And I will be the person that pulls, okay? And, and I'll pretend there's an abyss there, and I'll pull. And for many patients, there's no conception of having an alternative at all. Can't quite sort of figure out. And I'll just encourage them, you know, sometimes, right, well, what's the only thing you can do? I usually realise, and then they just let go, right? And, and it's, it's sometimes quite crucial what, what happens in that few seconds after they've let go. What actually, you know, whether there's a wee dawn of enlightenment in terms of, of, of seeing what the, what, the, what the problem is. And what can very often happen is the patients do see that suddenly they've got a free pair of hands. But also, they've not gone into the abyss. But also, crucially, I, their pain, am still here. I'm still, you know, I've not, I've not left. I've not gone down the abyss, right? I'm still here hurling abuse at them as their sort of metaphorical pain, yeah? So there's no change there, but there's a couple of things that have happened that the patient didn't actually think would happen, i.e. they've not fallen into the abyss and actually by letting go, nothing disastrous has happened and actually there's a potential metaphorically for them to be able to plough their energy into something else. Does that make some sense? Splendid. And then there's a, our, our wonderful thing, I'm sure that you'll have heard of the concept of monsters on a bus. And apart from this reminding me of every single school trip I ever had in my life, um, it's a very good and useful way of helping us think a little bit about this notion of acceptance. Are you familiar, anybody, yeah, most, most people familiar with this idea? If you're not, basically what it's sort of suggesting is that um, the, the metaphor is one of having your pain as a, and, and difficult feelings and anxiety and depression and decondition, all the, all the unpleasant experiences on the bus and how much time we spend with the bus parked up doing nothing because all of the energy is in trying to get the unruly passengers off the bus, right? Um, whether it's the pain, whether it's difficult feelings, whether it's suppressing them, whatever. And of course, what we realise after a while is that the bus is going nowhere. And every time we try to fling these unpleasant experiences off bus, turn around and they're back on. And this is quite a useful um, conceptualisation of helping people see how, how the, the problems of resisting and the problems of um, uh, spending so much time wrapped up in trying to push aversive experiences away. And so much of it, what acceptance and commitment therapy is about is helping people drive the bus even though it's got some unruly passengers on it, okay? Um, what would be the preference spending forever more getting things off the bus that you don't like or at least having an unruly set of passengers and ending up where you vaguely want to go or at least on the road to it? Yeah? So there we go. So back again, our hexaflex. 
told you it was a quick tour. Cognitive diffusion. This is an area I feel reasonably okay about, uh, I think. Um, cognitive diffusion is just, again, a very sort of psychobabbly phrase for helping patients become much more aware of the sense of becoming tangled up with their, their thoughts and their feelings as well. Um, and spending an awful lot of time uh, ruminating, poring over worries, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen with my pain, um, what if that happens, what if this happens, I used to be able to do this, I used to be able to do that. So we've all met patients who even perhaps within session, you know, within the session, they're there, but they're kind of not there, you know, because they're kind of in their heads and they're trying to figure things out because that's what heads do, and very good. And one of the, the I think, um, very helpful concepts um, of ACT is uh, helping patients see the thoughts for what they are. So this is a fundamental shift for, for, uh, uh, that, that you're trying to make for, for, with patients. And it's the shift away from seeing thoughts as things that they have to be obeyed, that they're commands, that they're truths, you know, all of these sorts of things that many thoughts are, but not all of them, you know. Um, and helping patients see thoughts for what they are, just thoughts that come and go, that your mind generates just, you know, automatically, instead of things to be grabbed onto and um, responded to or reacted to, can be quite helpful. So it's about stepping back and noticing thoughts come and go. You're not your thoughts. And this important idea of looking at your thoughts rather than from them. So what I'm meaning about, uh, with regards to that is helping you look at your thoughts and go, oh, what's actually, what, what's, my, what's my head giving me today? You know, what, what's it saying? What's, what's going through my head, literally, you know? So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time noticing here what my head's saying to me. So for myself there, just there, um, uh, my head was telling me, 40 minutes, you told Andy 40 minutes. Are you having a laugh? Have you seen the time, right? So it's that sort of thing, okay, um, that, um, that, uh, that diffusion tries to do. So it's taking a step back. Instead of getting caught up, seeing thoughts as commands, bully statements, uh, an example would be helping patients watch for how thoughts can add to the suffering of their pain. So many patients can come in, you know, describe their pain, um, but then describe all, everything around it. You know, it's absolutely horrendous. It's a burning pain. It's a pain I've never had before. It's completely laid me flat. There's nothing I can do to do, to do, to do, to do, to do. And if patients are fused with all of that type of thinking, you can see how the suffering is added to. So the idea is having a, bit of a pair of binoculars. Um, but having them permanently stuck onto your eyes. Imagine that. Imagine that crazy notion. And all you see uh, is the world through your binoculars, right? So you don't see anything else, right? And after a while, you just, you know, that's the way the world is, whether it's rose tinted or otherwise, right? And diffusion is about helping patients take, literally take the, well, not literally, but, but metaphorically take the, the binoculars off their, uh, the, the, from their eyes, helping them see the binoculars, if you like, and also realizing that, you know, they can look around them and that there's more to see than just through the binoculars, okay? So that's the idea, at least. So, back to the hexaflex. This is something you'll be very familiar with, so I'll be rattling through this. Contact with the present moment, aka mindfulness. So going from this idea of being a think thinking human being, somebody who's sort of logically figuring things out, problem solving, getting to the root of the issue, to simply taking a step back and noticing what's going on. And that can be very powerful for patients if they get that notion because um, they can begin to see the present for what it is. So patients can often start going, well, why on earth do I want to be anywhere near the present? That's where my pain is, you know? I'd rather be somewhere as far away as I possibly can. And it can often be quite a breakthrough moment for patients if they can actually sit for periods with the pain, but it's that business of noticing in a non-judgmental um, uh, way that mindfulness tries to encapsulate. So it's versus this idea of figuring out, being in the past or the future, worrying about what's going to happen, comparing yourself with the past and all the things you used to be able to do, analysing, predicting, doing all that thing that the brain's really good at doing and has evolved to do, but which gets us into trouble. 
and that's what mindfulness is very uh, good at doing. So noticing body sensations such as pain, sitting with them, awareness of the mind drifting off as well. Okay? And that's a good one. So it's a little bit, a bit out of focus there, um, but it, there's a difference between having your mind full, and I don't know about the rest of you, but my drive to work in the morning, don't remember much of it because my head's full of that and not actually what's going on. I'm quite a safe driver, but I'm just saying. And that's a good way of putting it from the renowned uh, philosopher, uh, Ferris Bueller. And, it's a, and it's, a, it's a vital point actually with mindfulness as well, um, because the tendency is that if our heads are full of things and we're not in the present moment, then we miss an awful lot of the reality of what's going on. And for pa chronic pain patients, I think that's a big deal that when they notice that they can sit with the pain um, and it's not all of the things that their head tells them it is, that can be quite crucial. So moving on very quick. Self as context. This is really one that's danger of disappearing up its own bahuki. Um, it's a, again, this is a little bit like the idea of um, a, a mindfulness, but it's a bit of a sort of a meta mindfulness. And it's this idea of um, most of us defining ourselves by what our lives have been like, what we've ended up being good at, not so good at, some of the memories that we have, you know, all of that sort of stuff combines to make us believe we are who we are, right? And of course, it's relevant for chronic pain because a lot of patients sort of define themselves because they've had pain for so long, they define themselves as people who've got, you know, pain, you know, or I am pain sometimes. Um, and what self as context is trying to do is to get people uh, a, a little bit away from that uh, and seeing yourself as the context in which experiences play out. God, that's really fluffy. But trying to disengage from, from that defined, rigid sense of self, you know? Oh, well, I'm no good at this, or I'm, I'm quite good at that, or I used to do that, used to do that, and well, this is me. And that can be quite comforting, and that's what we all do. But it's problematic if we conceptualize ourselves just entirely as, uh, you know, people are this or people are that. And um, the sense of, of trying to disengage from that um, and not restricting ourselves or seeing ourselves entirely as being defined by our past. Because ultimately, none of us can remember everything that happened to us, you know, that, that, that got us to this point. You know, we, we don't have brilliant autobiographical memories, um, but, we, you know, we sort of we, we remember snippets and bits. Um, and the observer self, this, this ability to look outside of yourself and, and, and steps out of the inter internal battles to see actually what's going on. Um, and probably the best way of sort of explaining this is that many patients describe themselves in a battle, you know, and, and you, can, you could sort of see it as a, as a chessboard and they're constantly sort of in that battle. They're either winning one day, not winning the other day, good days and bad days, my pain's got the better of me today, and they're constantly in that struggle. And what self as context or the observer self is trying to do is to help them see that actually they're, they're not necessarily, they don't need to be part of that. They can step away from it and actually be the chessboard, right? And a better way of looking at it, because not a lot of folk play chess these days, do you notice that? Is it, many patients can identify with the idea of, of uh, actors on a stage, you know? And, it, and they can see that very often what, what's happening is that they're getting so, you know, caught up with the, the other actors, whether it's the pain or whether it's, um, you know, whether it's difficult feelings, difficult thoughts or whatever. Uh, and they never think that they can actually consider themselves as the theatre or even taking a step back from it uh, and going to row K, as I describe it, all right, and actually seeing what's going on. And so putting themselves a little bit more as the context or the whole theatre, seeing themselves a little bit more uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a broader definition rather than just being defined by what's going on at the moment, what might happen in the future, whatever. And so, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a sort of a nicer way of, of helping to redefine themselves um, a little bit more in terms of the context in which those experiences happen rather than the experiences themselves. Because at the end of the day, Whatever experiences we've had, we've, we've always just been there. We've always just been there. Like the theatre's just there. The chessboard is just there. Whatever happens in it, you know, happens. 
but actually encouraging patients to see themselves as a little bit outside of that is, is the idea of self. Um, so a couple more. I've already gone over my 40 minutes, I know that. I'll be self-flagellating later on. Uh, values, big thing, big deal. Um, and we can be a bit precious about it in ACT. But fundamentally what it boils down to, ACT, is what's really important to you. And it can sound quite sort of selfish, this, but it's really quite interesting. Never fulfill our values, just goals are sort of steps along the way. So values are a bit more like paths. That, that, that we go down or that we try to go down. And again, if you think about it for a lot of our chronic pain patients, they're about as far away from where they ideally want to be very often, you know? They're caught in that battle, caught in the struggle, caught in the stage, caught up in their minds, um, trying to fight the good fight. And the, many of them have forgotten what their values actually were, you know? Or if, they were, uh, if they're still aware of them, whether it's to do with sort of family or whatever, um, it's been that long since they've been engaged with, with those values and sort of ploughing that line or going down that path. So it helps us live meaningful lives despite difficulties uh, in the service of values versus being stopped by thoughts, beliefs, physical sensations. Well, you know, I can't, there's no, I, I used to be able to do that. I met a lady today, you know, I used to be a really good swimmer, absolutely fantastic, that's out now, can't do that. There's other things I've not been able to do, you know, and, and, and that becomes the norm. It just becomes the norm so often uh, and so doing some values work within ACT is a very helpful thing in helping patients get a little bit back to um, where they'd like to be going and I don't think we should ever presume necessarily that they, that they, that they know that um, or that they remember it because they've been fighting the good fight for as long as they have and some examples of values you know are in the areas of parenting, family, work, leisure, health, spirituality, whatever those are, you know. But I'm just giving you the sort of sense that there's sort of themes around values rather than a specific goal, you know. Goals might be helpful in terms of um, uh, what you might do, but, um, but the general sense. So uh, the best metaphor, best sort of analogy is, is uh, a compass. We all like to, you know, it's good to have a compass to know where you're kind of going in life. Um, but if you think about it from our pain patient's point of view, how often that, that compass route gets knocked off, uh, or knocked off course in the service actually of getting back and fighting with the pain. So that's all that value is about. Committed action, moving in a valued direction. So really, uh, as I was sort of saying, I think there, that it's all very well being mindful, seeing yourself outside the situation a little bit, noticing what's going on, having a choice, um, knowing what your values are. But if you're still sitting doing hee-haw, then, you know, it's not really the de that original definition of, of acceptance. So committed action is about moving in a direction that you want to go based on your values. So it's the, it's the usual suspects. It's the, you know, it's, the, it's the good stuff that we know from CBT and various other things, setting smart goals, doing what it takes to live in a more valued way. So not just looking at the compass and wondering, you know, well, what if, that'd be great, you know, it'd be absolutely fantastic. It's actually taking a step in that direction and, and, and again, sort of demonstrating that willingness. So versus avoiding pain, getting caught up, putting off, predicting the outcome, to do, to do, to do. And so an example is setting simple goals for being with the family, looking after self. There's an important point, which is that sometimes we set goals for patients um, that seem to be good ones, seem to be sort of, you know, will we'll help the overall presentation, but are they to do with what the patient wants to do? Are they, are they linked with the patient's values? And that's something, something I think that, that's quite important. So this is it. Told you it was whistle stop. It's all about psychological flexibility. So this is a summary slide really. So it's, it's, it's about these sorts of things. Watching out, not being governed by your thoughts. And in order to do that, being aware of exactly what is actually, you know, what's your head giving you today? What's it bullying you about? What's it telling you you should be doing? What's it telling you you should have done a wee bit better? 40 minutes is what I should have done better. Uh, seeing the present for what it truly is, it's a, and it's often an okay place. And I, I think if I was to say that there's one, if you can get to that sort of point with chronic pain patients, it's often very, very difficult. Um, but seeing the present for what it actually is, it, it not being too bad, um, and actually realizing that helps people see that there's less of a need to keep on pulling or pushing things away. 
So I think there's, there's something about that being in the present moment and realizing that it's, it's, it's an okay place to be and that it's, it's not aversive, it's not as aversive, uh, is, is, is actually you know, quite a breakthrough thing. Not being defined by our memories, experiences and labels as well. You know? If you think about it, I mean, all of us kind of restrict to our options potentially in life about what we do. You know? um, um, and, 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 and very often that's to do with some of our, our, our experiences in life and our memories and what we feel we're good at and not good at and the personality styles that we d define ourselves by. And sometimes that can become restricting and, 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 and uh, inflexible. So not being entirely defined by our memories, but maybe a bit more by our values. Willing acceptance of the things we can't change. We all know the serenity uh, creeds, which I'll not, I'll not bore you with, but it's that sense of realizing that there are things that we can't change um, and think a little bit about the amount of energy that we've maybe been plowing into trying to change it and holding out the compass now and again. Simple as that. Figuring out, well, hang on, where am I going? Uh, and that can be very helpful, I guess, for all of us, not just our, our pain patients. Thanks a lot. <laughs>